The Shining Ones of Mesopotamia Legends of the Ancient Gods of Sumeria An ancient civilization called the Sumerians lived in southern Mesopotamia, which is located in modern-day Iraq. They are known for developing the first widely accepted system of writing, cuneiform, and being one of the earliest civilizations to develop a unified government. The Sumerians also created one of the earliest known urban centers and established what would go on to become some of our most important legal institutions today. One of the earliest known civilizations, Sumer is said to have sprung up after the Great Deluge. In its heyday, it was one of the most advanced civilizations in human history. The Sumerians were responsible for creating some of our most fundamental systems, writing, city-states and law. The civilization was essentially developed in the area known today as Iraq, but also included parts of modern-day Iran, Kuwait, Syria and Turkey. Sumerians were some of the first people to develop the written word and city-states. Originally from Sumer, our civilizations are said to be based on that of ancient Sumer, and it is said by many historians and academics that our current civilizations are based on that of ancient Sumer, as many of our most essential institutions find their origins in the culture of this long-lost civilization. They were the first to create a written language, they were probably the first to develop a system of laws, and they created the first city-state, Ur, about 4,000 years ago. The Sumerians developed the first widely adopted writing system, cuneiform, the Sumerians invented cuneiform around 3100 BC, depicting words and ideas through wedge-shaped marks pressed into clay tablets. Because this form of writing was etched onto wet clay, it could be easily erased after use, but had to be written quickly before the tablet dried. The Sumerians used their language for over 3000 years until they were conquered by other cultures in around 2000 BC. However, the word Sumerian is still used today as an adjective referring to anything from ancient Mesopotamia or having something to do with ancient civilizations. The Sumerians were a people who lived in Mesopotamia, part of modern-day Iraq, and were the first civilization to leave behind records of their history. The first recorded beginnings of this civilization date back to approximately 3400 BC. The ancient Sumerian cities were united under one king at that time, Lugalbanda. This king created a system of laws for his kingdom, which later became the basis for all law codes today. The Sumerians were deeply religious people who worshipped their gods with all their might and also believed that they had descended from them. Additionally, the Sumerian society was responsible for creating the first actual city-states and the first system of laws which has become a pillar in Western society today. In short, many aspects of modern life can be traced back to this ancient civilization. The Sumerians were deeply religious people who worshipped their gods with all their might and also believed that they had descended from them. The tremendous Mesopotamian deity Enki, the god of wisdom and science, is known as the Lord of Abundance because he formed heaven and earth out of the abyss, created humans from clay, taught them everything they know about farming, medicine, astronomy and mathematics. He was a mighty god who could control elements such as fire or water at his will. The priestesses would speak to these gods through what we now call divination, a practice that's been around for thousands of years. They would use an object like a piece of wood or stone called an ikura, which means divining rod in Babylonian, to determine what fate had in store for them. They could also use animal skins to predict whether someone would live or die. This is just one example of how these ancient civilizations worshipped their deities with great fervor before religions spread across most parts of Europe during medieval times when Christianity became dominant thanks to its influence over political power structures throughout Europe after Constantine converted Rome into Christianity's capital city by building churches there in AD 324. 
Sumerian mythology is a collection of stories about the gods of Sumeria and their interaction with humans. This legend tells of the strange and beautiful tales passed down over generations from those who once inhabited this ancient land. In these legends we learn how our ancestors believed their world was created by gods and goddesses responsible for all aspects of life on earth. The Shining Ones Shining One is an ancient Sumerian word for gods. The Shining Ones refer to various groups of gods that have had their names changed and their identities intertwined due to the transfers between cultures. They are also known as the Watchers, Angels, Sages, Apkalu, and Immortals. The Watchers The Watchers are mentioned in the Bible in a book called Enoch, 2 Enoch 6, 1-8, where they were said to be angels who taught humans the ways of civilization before being cast out of heaven by God. According to this legend, they lived among us on earth, but then became too attached to human customs, so they were forced into outer space when God saw what was happening. The Watchers, or Grigori, the term used in the Book of Enoch, were angels who descended to earth and took human wives. As a result of their disobedience, God cast them out of heaven. He then made Eve so that Adam would have a partner with whom he could procreate the human race. According to the apocryphal texts, they taught humanity in areas such as art, science and technology, and forbidden knowledge such as weapon-making. The sons of Anu are mentioned numerous times throughout ancient Mesopotamian literature. They are described as having wings and eyes like lightning bolts, which is certainly an apt description. Their leader was named Urokabaramil, or Amaros. He was said to be tall with a beard down to his chest, which may explain why he was so difficult to spot among all those naked Sumerians running around. At some point during this period, there were two angels called Samyaza, Samael, and Azazel, who became leaders of this group after Urokabaramil departed from earth. These two would eventually rebel against God alongside him during their lifetimes on earth, and Samyaza even tried his hand at rebelling many centuries later when he turned into the serpent known as Leviathan to seduce Eve before she had been tempted by Satan himself. The Apkalu were a group of seven sages created to help humanity. They were created by Enki, the god of wisdom and intelligence. The seven Apkalu were sent to earth to teach humans how to live in a civilized manner. In Mesopotamia, there were two types of gods, those who ruled over nature, like Enlil, and those who ruled over culture, like Enki. The Apkalu represented the latter group as they taught man about agriculture, mathematics, writing, and music. The immortals are the gods, the watchers are the immortals, the sages are watchers, shining ones who dwell in heaven and earth, Anunnaki, Enki, who make all things live, Apkalu, who know all things, they are shining ones, wise men from before the flood. All these were made by Enki's engendering wisdom. The Sumerian cuneiform tablets show us that the Apkalu was the wisest of all the gods, and that there were Shining Ones who guarded them. The Shining Ones were known for their immortality. This is why they are referred to as immortals. They are eternal beings who watch over man from above and guide them through life. The Shining Ones also appear in other cultures, like Mesopotamia or Babylon, where they were called Anunnaki, the Ancient Ones. In Greek mythology they were known as Olympians. In Egypt they are called Ra. We can see similarities between these ancient legends and stories worldwide. It's hard to believe that these stories could be made up of people who had never travelled far from their own village, yet it is clear that they have common roots somewhere in a time long before recorded history began. The best conclusion is that they are all part of a much larger story, one with an ancient origin that even our earliest ancestors knew about. One thing we do know for sure, though, the Shining Ones were real. Chapter 1 
king's lists and demigods. The so-called king list is one of the world's most remarkable and valuable historical documents. It lists the names of the kings of Sumer and their reign periods from what is known to them as the beginning of history, a time when the kingship descended from heaven, founded five cities on the Mesopotamian plain in the distant past. During the deluge or great flood, the flood swept over the land. The narrative returns to kingship as the flood sweeps over the land, up to the part of the Isin dynasty which began ruling about 1950 BC, it describes the kings and their reigns. According to the king list, many antediluvian kings ruled for long periods. In this sense, it confirms the long lifespan of the patriarchs. Even though these highly long reigns and lifespans cannot be explained, Secular and religious sources indicate they followed a logic that has yet to be recognized by current scholarship, having been independently corroborated by the archaeological evidence for the 4th and 3rd millennia BC, King List has received mixed reviews among scholars. In his book The Sumerians, Sam Noah Kramer, the Dean of Sumerian Studies, argues that King List is inestimably valuable if used with discrimination and understanding. We do not begin our story with the creation of the world. Our ancestors may have come here for unknown reasons. Proto-Sumerians are the first intelligent life forms on Earth, known historically as the Proto-Sumerians. The deluge was a worldwide catastrophe that happened before they arrived here. Moreover, modern humans or Homo sapiens didn't exist then. Our Western civilization was initiated by these Proto-Sumerians who were initially based in Mesopotamia, which means the land between the two rivers. Their descendants' records, the Sumerian, Akkadian and Babylonian cuneiform tablets, report the arrival of these gods. Between the rivers Tigris and Euphrates lie Mesopotamia, the birthplace of civilization. The two rivers flow down to the Persian Gulf through a vast grassy plain in Armenia's mountains in the north. Marshes and lagoons dominated the area in ancient times, as they do today. With the development of a river canal system for irrigation and drainage, the plain grew densely populated and developed a rich culture. A fertile garden area developed in the lower part of Mesopotamia, known as Edin, or the abode of the righteous ones. It became known as the Garden of Eden in the Bible. Sumer was the name given to the southern part of Mesopotamia, whereas Akkad was given to the area further up the plain, near the convergence of the two rivers. Babylonia was named after the Akkadian city Babilu, which became prominent throughout the region. Mesopotamia's alluvial plain was used to rebuild the Sumerian cities after the deluge. Because the oldest of these dated back to about 3500 BC, and was constructed on virgin soil, it is clear that they were not built over the ruins of a former city. Due to its rising waters, the Persian Gulf flooded the former cities during the deluge. Anunnaki, as these alien beings were called, arrived on this planet for unknown reasons. We can, however, assume that it was for commercial purposes based on their myths and legends. Approximately 240,000 years ago they came here, according to King List. According to this document, the antediluvian Anunnaki established kingship at Eridu, the Erech of the Bible, as a result of kingship descended from heaven. For 64,800 years, two kings ruled. During the 108,000-year reign of three kings at Badtibira, Eridu was abandoned as the capital. The kingship was then transferred to Larak, where one king ruled for 28,800 years. A king, Enmedurana, ruled for 21,000 years in Sipar, the fourth city they made their capital. Enmedurana is essential to our story since he was the Old Testament's Enoch, as we will see. In 18,600 years, one king ruled Shuropak under the kingship of Shuropak. For 241,200 years, eight kings ruled five cities, as summarized in the tablet. According to King List, 
all commercial activities ended after the flood swept over the land. The vast number of these numbers has puzzled scholars for a long time. There is no error in them since they are consistent throughout King's List. Despite the lack of a rational explanation, most historians believe there must be a logical explanation since the enormous lifespan of the antediluvian patriarchs parallels these numbers. Earth years may not be what we know them to be. Despite not being fully understood, the divine year or year of On mentioned in the cuneiform tablets is probably not the same as our average earth year. The Old Testament reflects this. One holy day is equivalent to a thousand years in the Old Testament. Psalms 94. Ancients also computed time by other than average earth years. For instance, in the Book of Jubilees, where a jubilee year is equivalent to 50 regular years. Namely, seven week years, a week year was seven years, and one year added for atonement, at which all activities were supposed to end. It is also evident from their system of enumeration that the years of King's List have an underlying logic. While their numerical system was sexagesimal, it was not strictly so, since both tens and sixes were employed. They assigned the number 60 to their chief god, An, since it was the highest number in their system of numerical rank. Accordingly, sequences 1, 10, 60, 360, and 3600 have special meanings in their mythology. Sumerians called the number 3600 a shah, which appears to have special significance. This number is divisible by the years of the reign of Sumerian kings after a slight adjustment. As a result, Sumerian antediluvian kings' reigns were probably a shah, renewable every 3,600 years. A graphic representation of the duration of the various terms of kingship reveals that this sexagesimal system accounts for many entries in king list. Only in the later cultures did the notion of divine beings filter into our language and think that we refer to our alien visitors as gods. In ancient times, they were called Ilu, which evolved into Ili and El respectively in Hebrew. Westerners have used the term God to refer to superior spiritual beings who are distant from man and incapable of defect or error. If the term could be used generically to describe a Saurian race, they might be called supermen. Conversely, man is regarded as a blemished, imperfect creature burdened with original sin and destined to worship an unreachable god. There was nothing spiritual about the Sumerian gods. Their errors and misjudgments could be severe because they were human beings. It was considered a convenience by the Sumerian gods and nothing more. Their wants were met, their cities were maintained, and cannon fodder was provided for their various military ventures. The gods can be cruel and unsympathetic masters. Their view of humans was that they were merely unruly children, no more valuable than pets, to be ruled ruthlessly and without sentiment. Despite what the reader might think, Subsequent events demonstrate that these accusations were true. Despite the term Anunnaki being used generically to refer to all the proto-Sumerians who came to this planet, it literally means the sons of An, their great god. In the antediluvian period, the Anunnaki colonized Earth with a large group of their children. In the Babylonian creation myth, Enuma Elish, 300 of these Anunnaki descended to Earth while another 300 remained on board. Igigi was presumably the spacecraft technician. His name was always written pictorially as a star, as An or Anu in Akkadian. He stood above all the other gods as the great progenitor and senior god. A spaceship orbiting the sun, or Uru Sargana, literally the chief city of the heavens, was his abode and seat of authority. Ziggurats are mountain tops or stage towers that provided artificial platforms on the flat Mesopotamian plains and came from the Babylonian word Zakuru. In times of crisis or ceremonial purposes, he descended to earth only on special occasions. In Uruk, his sacred city, 
he lived in his temple, the Aana, or House of An. Three children were born to Anu, two sons, Enlil and Enki, and a daughter, Ninkusag. He spent much of his time settling disputes between his two sons and his grandchildren due to the division of authority between them. Enlil, known as the Lord of the Command, was the commander of the Anunnaki expedition to Earth. While Enlil was Anz, the younger son, he became the most powerful god of the Sumerian pantheon after An. His authority was described by many appellations. The Lord of Heaven and Earth, the Lord of all lands, the Giver of Kings, the Prince of Heaven, and the Chief of Earth. Enlil is actually the archetype for the god of the western lands of Palestine and Syria, the El of the Semites, and especially the generic El or Elohim of the Bible. Humanity was punished by Enlil for the decrees of the gods in council. As a symbol of his powerful arsenal, he is often shown carrying a bow and arrow. Humans were only tolerated by Enlil as necessary to provide for their welfare. As recorded in the Sumerian deluge story, humanity's destruction was caused by Enlil's interference with his rest. Duranki, a temple dedicated to him at Nippur, was called the Bond of Heaven and Earth, from where he directed mankind's activities. Cuneiform tablets contain this structure as a control or communication center. At the top of the Ekur at Nippur, he raises the beams that search the hearts of all lands. The equipment used sounds like some sort of radar or scanning device. During Enlil's reign, there were times of turmoil. When he saw a goddess naked and bathing by a stream below, he became enamored of her and descended to seduce her. The Pantheon was horrified as Enlil's escapade seemingly violated one of their basic conventions. He was stripped of his powers despite being the chief god. Enlil returned to his authority after marrying his chief wife and making her his chief wife. She was given the same status as Enlil and was named Ninlil. Enlil's favorite son was Nanar, born out of this episode. He was given honors and lands commensurate with his rank in the Pantheon, second only to him and Enki. Enki was An's firstborn, but he was given a lower rank than his younger brother Enlil, who was An's half-sister. Enlil became heir to the throne according to Sumerian inheritance laws. His brother Enlil and Enki fought over who would control activities on Earth because of lingering resentment over Enki's disinheritance. A chief engineer, a chief scientist, a chief of mining, and, most importantly, creator of mankind, Enki was all things to the expedition. When Enki first arrived on Earth, he was also called Ea, or he whose house is on the water, a reference to his water place or Abzu, where he carried out his operations. Poseidon, god of the sea, is mentioned again in this oceanic reference to Enki or Poseidon. As a master engineer, he transformed Lower Mesopotamia's marshes into a paradise. The canal system was planned and constructed, rivers were diked, and marshlands were drained. An admiring poem boasts that he created the marshlands as a paradise for birds and fishes, invented and used the plow yoke, started animal husbandry, and brought the construction arts to earth to raise the cities. The epithets of Enki were numerous. Among his many titles, he was God of Wisdom, Mining, Lord of the Flowing Waters, and Lord of the Sea and Shipbuilding. As a symbol of his ability to provide navigable waters and potable water for Mesopotamia cities, he is often depicted with a stream and fish flowing from his shoulders. His home was named Eridu, which signified that it was a colony. In the watered plains of Edin, Eridu was the first city built by alien astronauts on Earth. It was Enki's favorite pastime to sail or cruise these watercourses in his watercraft, which he named the Ibex after the nimble goats that lived in the mountains nearby. Sumerian seals and monuments often depicted the Ibex and goat with a fishtail as symbols of the god Enki. A human miner is often depicted carrying an ingot of metal held by Enki, the god of mining. 
To facilitate its carrying on a pole with a handle, the metal was molded in the form of a cylinder with a hole through the middle. Often shown as the tree or shrub of life, he was also shown with his two sons, Gibil and Negal, who were responsible for mining. Enki is remembered for creating man and defending him against the capricious Enlil. In addition to its ability to shed its skin and achieve immortality, the serpent is Enki's symbol. Ancient artisans represented their reptile ancestors by depicting the serpent. Caduceus of the Greeks was also derived from the serpent coiled around the Tree of Life. He distanced himself from Enlil by illegally creating modern man or Homo sapiens. Following the deluge, their children rekindled the antagonism between the two, which lasted for thousands of years. Even today, it might be added, those people don't stop fighting. Just as Enlil is revered as the god who brought on the deluge, Enki is revered as the god who warned the Sumerian Noah of coming disasters in time. The fourth senior Sumerian god was Ninkursag, or the Lady of the Mountaintop. Enki and Enlil were her half-siblings. When Ninkursag and Enki appeared together in the past, their names preceded each other. Later, her status was reduced, and she practically disappeared from the pantheon as an influential or significant figure. Using Sitchin's work, we learn that Ninkursag is the Egyptian equivalent of Isis, who in turn was renamed Juno by the Romans from Hera in Greek mythology. The rising star of Inanna or Ishtar may have eclipsed her, injecting herself into everything Sumerian and Western. Palestine, Syria and Lebanon were the Western lands where Ishtar appeared in different forms. Ninkursag was displaced by her mother goddess. As a goddess of love or sex, she played a crucial role in society. Also known as the warrior goddess, she played a militant role. In addition to Ninkursag, Ninkursag is known by many other names, including Ninti, the lady who gives life, Ninma, exalted lady, and Mamu, the creator goddess, a name from which we derive our word Mama. Isn't this great? She was known as Pachamama in the lands of the Mayans. As the expedition's chief medical officer and chief nurse, Ninkursag ruled the antediluvian city of Shurupak. A cutter knife was used to sever her umbilical cord, which was her sacred symbol. A hybrid mammal reptile called a Lulu was created by Enki and Ninkursag in the laboratories atop Shurupak ziggurat and Enki's floating headquarters a creature capable of taking over the burdensome work being performed by An's children, was created at Enlil's request. Enki provided Ninkursag with formulas and processes to create a worker, but it had one significant flaw. It couldn't reproduce. Enki and Ninkursag overreached their commission by giving this primitive, predominant mammal characteristics. There was an explicit pecking order among the Sumerian pantheon's astronaut gods. A numerical ranking system was used. Sumerians ascribed a unique, almost mystical significance to this number. Each central god had a numerical name representing his rank in the hierarchy. Numbers were therefore used as a form of cryptography. Sumerian ruling deities were ranked numerically in ascending order of importance. 60. Anu, 55 Antu, 50 Enlil, 45 Ninlil, 40 Enki, 35 Ninki, 30 Nana, 25 Ningal, 20 Utu, 15 Inanna, 10 Ishkur, 5 Nikusak. The distaff side was assigned numbers ending in 5. It caused much distress in the affairs of the Middle East for Inanna who refused to accept her status and entertained and plotted almost continuously. Enlil's rank and position as chief of all activities on Earth were represented by the number 50. As a result of the deluge, when the younger gods challenged the older gods' leadership authority, Enlil's military aide Ninurta assumed the title of 50. He thereby inherited Enlil's mantle of leadership, which he had apparently vacated. 
Ninurta was not the only leader vying for power. Enki's eldest son, Marduk, was unranked in the Pantheon. He also assumed the title of fifty to proclaim himself Babylonian king. Inanna, Nana, and Utu, with Inanna seemingly always involved, struggled for power after the eclipse of the senior gods after the deluge. Cities in Mesopotamia became pawns in the struggle between competing gods, resulting in constant warfare among them. Middle Eastern nations were significantly disrupted by it. Only Enlil's sons, daughters, wives, and grandchildren were given numerical rankings in the Pantheon. In the aftermath of the deluge, the sons of Enki were literally assigned geographical areas and activities away from Mesopotamia, a precaution on Enlil's part to prevent conflict between the cousins and retain control over Mesopotamia. It was always depicted graphically that Sumerian gods wore horned crowns. On an altar, horned crowns were used to represent the senior gods. On the cuneiform tablets, the names of the gods were always preceded by a pictographic symbol of a star or a dingir, which was a combination of din, meaning the righteous one, and gir, meaning bird. The ding symbol signifies a god distinguished from common humanity by his ability to move about in a celestial chariot or craft. As seen on the boundary stones or markers used by the Babylonian dynasties of the second millennium BC, each god had his own sacred animal and symbol. He was the favorite son of Enlil after Ninlil was raped. Mesopotamia, Syria, and Palestine were assigned to him after the deluge. Ur, or capital city, was his sacred city, and the crescent moon was his sacred symbol. As with the cross of Shamash, this symbol dominated the post-Diluvian era, and was later adopted by Islam. As discussed below, Nana, stroke Sin, is conspicuously absent from the myth of Zu. The Sumerian name Sin, the Sinai region was named after him, means the wise lord. Because Sumerian names can be read forward and backward, Zune may be the Enzu or the Lord Zu who stole the Tablets of Destiny from Enlil and had them retrieved by Ninurta with the aid of Ishkur and weapons from Enki. Furthermore, it explains Sin's fall from favor at times in Mesopotamian history and Ninurta's challenge for the rank of fifty. Inanna and Utu were twins born to Nana, and Utu was a grandson of Enlil. Antidiluvian Utu lived in a Sipar space platform where freighters loaded with metal shuttled between orbiting spaceships. Despite moving his space activities to Lebanon after the deluge, Sipar remained his sacred city where Baalbek became the new space platform. The western lands called him Shamash, his Semitic name. Beth Shamash, or the House of Shamash, was the Old Testament name for Baalbek. Shamash was symbolized by a four-pointed star on a disk covered with rays. Shamash later became associated with winged solar disks. Probably because his spacecraft surveyed all that went on below, Shamash was worshipped as the sun god who traversed the skies every day and the one from whom no secrets were hidden. According to a tablet at Sipar, circa 900 BC, he was known as the god of justice in the Babylonian pantheon. This tablet shows two horned gods holding divine cords which connect with Shamash's altar below. As a shuttle between heaven and earth, the cords represent his connection. He was said to have traversed the skies and measured the boundaries of the earth as the divine cardholder. The sun god Apollo, later known as Helios by the Romans, was known in Greek mythology as Utu stroke Shamash. He was known as Harpocrates in Egypt. Anunnaki chief astronaut Shamash was often depicted with wings. Ashur Nazipal II is depicted in a winged wheel hovering over the symbolic tree of life on an Assyrian relief from Nimrod. Symbols of immortality, a pine cone and a water bucket, are flanked by nobles and winged astronauts. In the Fibonacci sequence, Drunvalo Melchizedek talks about pine cone shapes. As a result of reading that, I looked at pine cones, which is true. This symbol of a pine cone associated with Utu could also indicate this, 
Since the Great Pyramid and Sphinx were built to serve as landing beacons for Space Commander Utu's Sinai spaceport, if the Fibonacci sequence is indeed incorporated into the mathematics of the Great Pyramid of Egypt, as Drunvalu suggests. The beloved of Anu, Inanna, was a twin of Shamash and the granddaughter of Anu. Just before the destruction of Agade, or Uruk, she became its patron deity. As Anu only visited Uruk occasionally, Inanna persuaded him to let her rule the city while he was away. In the western lands and Mesopotamia, she is depicted as a powerful goddess under the Semitic name Ishtar. As a symbol of the ruling gods, the eight-pointed star is very prominent, Dharma sign. Even though she was a woman and could not legally rule, Inanna or Ishtar injected herself into every aspect of politics. She attempted to seize power from her older sister Ereshkigal by descending to the netherworld. They created cro man by crossing the Lulu with the wild primitive man of the time, Neanderthal man. Enlil's wrath was brought down by this activity. Further diluting the reptile race, he viewed the Saurian strain as a direct threat. Not only was Inanna Anu's granddaughter, but she was also her great-granddaughter. It is often difficult to determine who is a sister, brother, or grandchild due to all the incestuous relationships among these various ranking gods and goddesses. In a future article devoted to royal lineages, these genealogical problems will be discussed in greater detail. Another myth describes her tricking Enki into giving her some of the Tablets of Destiny, or MEs, which gave her the authority and the means to become ruler of Uruk. As in the Gilgamesh epic, she offers her favors to Gilgamesh, whose resounding rejection enrages her to the point that she tries to destroy him. <laughs>